request of the United States Office of Civil Defense. At 3.40 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, NORA detected a long-range nuclear missile launch in North Korea. This missile is believed to be headed in the direction of the Los Angeles metropolitan area. It is believed that it will impact this area within the next one and one half to two hours. All residents within a 400 mile radius of this area should seek a fallout shelter immediately. Fallout is a product of nuclear attacks. Prolonged exposure to fallout will result in certain death. Fallout spreads across large areas approximately one minute after impact. If you cannot find a fallout shelter in your area, local authorities will lead you to one. Take a battery-powered radio and all essential supplies with you to the fallout shelter. Tune to 770 AM on your radio for emergency information. This is an emergency podcast of Hebrew Vision Live. We are going to be featuring Brother Philip Gillian who we're going to be engaging in some conversation in regards to politics and money. So you want to definitely tune in as we're just waiting for him to call in on our live podcast. We will be having a very, very intense conversation with our brother. But before we begin, as usual, I want to go ahead and open up with prayer and proceed. In that fashion. So in the spirit of prayer, hallelujah, yikadal, va yikadesh, shemei rabah, v'yamadi barak yerotei, v'yimelech malchutei, v'chayechunu v'yamichunu v'chayeh de kobet Yisrael, b'agala v'izman kari, v'imeru, amen. Yehesh shemei rabah mavorach le'olam ulmei amaya, yit barak v'yistabach, v'yipa'ah, v'yiromam, v'yiknesei, v'yitadah, v'yitalei, v'yitalah, shemei de kudusha berechu, v'yelam in kol barachata v'ashirota atush bechata v'nechbata, damiran v'ama, v'imeru, amen. Magnified and sanctified, may his great name be in the world he created by his will. May he establish his kingdom in your lifetime and in your days and in the lifetime of all the house of Israel, swiftly and soon, and let us say, Amen. May his great name be blessed forever and all time. Blessed and praised, esteemed and exalted, raised and uplifted, uplifted and, vow- and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed be he beyond any blessing, song, praise, and consolation other than the world. And let us say, Amen. We we have brother um Gillen on the line. That's what's up. That's what's up. What's good with you, my man? Well, I'm doing everything in my power to make us abide by the unnatural laws of man. Unfortunately, huh. making things right, changing the way we think. About all I do. No doubt. That's what I do. That's what you do. That's what we're going to get into tonight. I want to thank you first and foremost for, for agreeing to come on to the show, you know, on a short notice and, and, and making this possible to inform the people so that we can get your voice out there to the listening audience that I'm engaged with. Um, but just let us know, man, who, who Philip Gillen is. Who's the professor? Who is Professor Phil? Well, I'm I'm quite... Simple, simple creature. So it's uh, I was uh, was born to a one parent home. Uh, rose through the ranks of my of the uh, the legal field, and uh, and today I uh, I can say that I I made some of myself. Uh, as a, as a man, I, I would say that I'm a I'm a family oriented individual. Uh, they really settled in, settled in, tried to tried to make life right at one point in time. And I've been independent since then, but as far as uh, who I am, I guess I'm I'm a projection of what men what men should be. Hmm. So I can't say what what a man is. I mean, as a, as a as someone that would look at everyone else and say their image isn't mine, but at the end of the day, I say that every if every man had a mind, you know, a good mind, one that that would ensure that, or and inspire him uh, to be greater. I, I think that you know a lot of our problems. Me as a man, and those that would that would want to uh, want to see that you know evil didn't prevail, well, they'd be a, a lot like me. 
Indeed. But that's just my personal opinion, I guess. No doubt, no doubt. So you say you went through the ranks of the legal system. Can you can you expound on that before we really get into the meat and potatoes of what we're gonna do tonight? Well, uh, I've come against uh, some of the uh, biggest, hardest hidden professionals in the legal realm of possibilities, meaning the judicial and legislative and executive wranglings, and I've, I've come I've come away cleaned. Uh, Almost 98 percent, I'd say a good 98 percent of the time um, in my efforts to uh, play what essentially is the, uh, the, legal te- the legal term of what they call God. <laughs> so I interpreted myself through their eyes and uh, became the enigma of the legal realm. And I, I had a really, really hard time really getting momentum in, sh- in uh, places like Chicago and other places throughout the Midwest, but I never lost, uh, including times when I was uh, I was incarcerated very young. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, at the time, uh, you know, I'm in a very predominantly uh, drug-infested uh, neighborhood at the time, uh, 75th and Woods, real, real, kind of, kind of, you could say the country meets the city <laughs> type of atmosphere. People can drink lemonade among each other and have black parties and at night there were shootings and and there was at least two or three murders a day. So mm. in a sense you could say that I was I uh I, I was able to uh, I was able to I was able to compel my violent ways into the tendencies of the law and inadvertently correct not only myself but uh bend the system to my will, so to speak. I've never lost against an attorney or any judge. Now don't get me wrong, there are times where you know, there's just simply, uh, there's simply just outright corruption, or there's a deficiency in the law where they're just not going to abide by anything. And the rule of the letter is, I rule, and uh, you're subject to it. So at the end of the day, uh, unless you're mastering, uh, mastering the ways uh, of the uh, the language of law, uh, interpret it. No, no one can reinterpret except for those that acted at acted as gods. And I, I reconfigured myself to that, to that standard. And, uh, I, let's just say, like I said, I've, uh, went through the ranks. I went from the bottom of their class, uh, from the defense attorneys to their, to the, the top of their federal, uh, uh, federal, uh, federal, uh, judges, uh, even to the Supreme Court at the state. And I've just simply, uh, I've simply been uncontested, put it that way. That's powerful. That's powerful. So, so, Let's talk about just the the process in terms of the learning curve. You see what I'm saying? What what was it that you had had to to read, to study, to understand? You know, and I won't say understand to overstand because of course legalese understanding means you're placed under their subjection and their jurisdiction. What did you have to do to overstand um in that particular domain? What what types of things were you uh, exposed to as far as not not only the the actual legal proceedings but actually the jurisprudence. What types of matters in jurisprudence did you really you know in, uh, digest to really get this overstanding? Right. Can I can I can you do me a favor? What I want to do is I actually want to call for my uh, uh, for my Skype instead because my phone keeps breaking up for some odd reason. I don't know why, but uh, um, I can probably hear you a lot better. Uh, they're on the phone. If I can switch over here just for a second. Yeah. Go ahead. One moment. I'm going to dial the number in, and then I'll switch over and hang up on this phone. One moment here. It's asking me for an access code right now, so <laughs> give me one second. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. You're fine. <sighs> We're here live this evening with Professor Phil Gillen. We're going to be discussing politics and money. This is him that just called in on his Skype account. And the question, I don't know if you got to hear the question. The question, um, Professor Phil, was in regards I'm in, to... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm back now. Let me, let me mute this one here. There we go. Okay, great. You took that one out because I had an echo. But the question I had asked, can you hear me better, by the way? Yes, I can see you a lot better now. Yep. Wonderful. The question I had asked is what... Did you have to digest as far as to understand the proceedings, understand the legalese, to understand, you know, um, the jurisdiction, understand all the different um, matters and as relates to the legal proceedings 
uh, and to come up with your own understanding of jurisprudence. What did you have to do and what types of um, information did you read to acquire that, uh, that, that insight as well as the experience? As well as what? I'm sorry. Your experience. And you got somebody that just got on and looked like, or sounds like they just got off a flight. Yeah, I just <laughs> muted them. I don't, I don't know who they are there. I just muted this call because of the, the excessive noise. But go ahead. No, you said the last part. I couldn't catch the last part. I'm sorry. Uh, in terms of, you know, your experiences in the court as far as, you know, um, going through those proceedings, the legal proceedings, but also, you know, the the arsenal of information that you read to come up with your insight and your understanding of, of this, this system. That we know of, and we'll get into the system very shortly. Okay. Well, what I learned was is really just, um, uh, you know, at the very beginning, the least, uh, the least of my, uh, the least of my studies really came from people's mistakes, uh, including judicial mistakes, where judges actually um, uh, said certain things and had to stricken things from records. Um, I used to uh, do what it's called court watching. I'd go in and actually, you know, study the behavior, study what they said, how they said it, what they were trying to say, what they what they're actually interpreting by saying one thing it means something completely different, and then looking up the definitions. Now the definitions were kind of, uh, I mean, I'm I'm going through dictionary, legal dictionary after legal dictionary, trying to figure out how things are, con- how these components, these words are interpreted in their linguistical way. How are they twisting it and bending these words to yield to their belief and the, the basis of the belief that's already uh, <clears throat> established through writing? In other words, how are they able to interpret these things? I mean, just like a, a, a mathematician, all he has to do is memorize numbers. Uh, all someone that, that does, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that's a very good writer. Uh, has to be able to uh, recognize words that correlate with a sentence and then what sentence would correlate with a paragraph and things of this nature. You're, you're talking about a very simple, basic way of being able to look through, uh, I guess you could even say a simple-minded veil, you know, things that are quite literally in front of you, but you have to be able to recognize it when it's happening. It doesn't have to happen in real time. It can happen in, It can happen five years from now. If they change the laws. They change the way they say things and the way they choose to uh, use the jargon. They can do it overnight, but for everyone to catch on, it may take years. I mean, there's some judges still using uh, certain um, certain laws that are even not on the books anymore in certain states where they're, they're told, you know, eventually it comes down that a ruling had been passed, and some of them are slow to catch on. Others don't see that it's beneficial uh, to discontinue the type of practices they're involved in, and then others are just, I'm going to follow the rule to the letter. So I think that, I, and this is the, 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 the biggest way as I figured out was going in and out of the system myself. I had to test mm-hmm. it out, literally, you know, mm-hmm. getting caught with, with guns, just doing bad things to get, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. It's not because I want to be incarcerated. It's just, I won't be the person, uh, uh, I read on uh, Joe Battis, the only the, the man uh, in uh, Chicago that happened to never spend a jail, a day in jail. And I figured, you know what, honestly, I can do that too. Mm. And as a youth, because I was so used to being able to uh, get into the system, break it down, and, and evade evade prosecution for some odd reason, I started realizing I can do it by literally going into the system, meaning literally being caught for something I've done and get away with it. So after reading, being able to interpret things, which is the most important part of the way the law works. If you don't, if you can't interpret the law properly, uh, it, they'll they'll run right over you. I mean, they'll take whatever you say, twist it, and use it right up against you. Matter of fact, ninety percent of the cases, well, I'd say about ninety nine percent of the cases uh, in American law is pretty much twisted around the way it's interpreted. So a lot of interpretation from what they may say in court to what it actually says by law is all the room in presumption, meaning the the, the law that allows you to uh, use a, a use a uh, extraordinary an, an extraordinary measure that doesn't apply to the to the statute at all. This allows you to use circumstantial ideas. These are beliefs that things could have happened or could have occurred, 
and therefore reasonable doubt just waves the entire balance of law. That means that you can just come in there just under the theory that somebody had done something. Therefore, you're a criminal. You're labeled uh, based on these presumptions. And the, again, these people don't read the law. You know, if you were to ask jury to read the law and do it to the letter of the law, they couldn't, in, they, you can't interpret assumption, which is to assert things that's based on what you believe uh, on the basis of law that basically points towards all the evidence, which would be very inconsistent. Almost all of the, almost all of the cases I've dealt with have been inconsistent. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because the law doesn't interpret what they're saying. <laughs> so they bend this under what they call the rule of presumption. I'm just going to make it up. And if it, if, if it can be fabricated into the belief of a, of a criminal act, it is an, in fact a criminal act. And therefore you get charge for something, and then they turn around and lock you up for something completely different. Matter of fact, they can, they, you can get caught with some baggies and say, and, and, and assume uh, that, uh, was it, uh, they can assume that, uh, uh, that you were going to sell marijuana, you're going to sell some type of uh, paraphernalia, drug of some uh, of choice, and, and, and just because of that assumption, they can label that a criminal act. So again, this, this goes down to, again, at the same time, Understanding what a line of the law is, and, and, and it's purely based on, I mean, if you, look, if you read the law, there's no speculation. Mm -hmm. It's direct spot on as into what it can and cannot do. Whereas the line where there's no buffer in the courts is that they're not legislatures. Even though they work for them, they act like a completely different body. Uh, it's like a different body of water. One pond turns around and throws a shark over, and then you've got tw uh, 20 of them in your pond trying to eat all the fish up. The main reason why this happens is because one thing does not, one thing, the law, the, the lawmakers are not responsible for what the judicial sector does. It just mm. goes and does what it wants on the basis of what rules they've been given and rules they make up as they go along, including mm. rules that the, the, the uh, Constitution would extend to them that they can make up as well. So as far as learning it, I mean, I took a, I took a, a almost a fit close. To, I'm over 15 years now in my studies, and I'd have to say that for the most part, law really is just uh, the, the balance of equity. It's kind of like a house. You're paying until you find out what you did wrong, <laughs> and in the end, by the time you figure that out, when you become mature, you realize that you fight back. Uh, intellectuals, it's, it's almost, and I'm not saying that everybody is sitting around waiting. For their time to do, and then they just get released and they go out into the streets. But I'd say about you know 80, 81 percent at this point in time, the, the ones that literally have nothing too much to lose at this point, they go out and do practically nothing uh, in the sense of being able to understand where they, not just where they went wrong. Where does this law come from? What, how does this happen? You know, you get your, your cases where a brother will wind up literally going out there reading the law and saying, wait a minute, I could do the same thing these lawyers are doing. He goes in, he gets a practice, and next thing you know, he goes from Mexicon uh, to uh, getting into uh, 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 getting brothers released on the basis of what the law actually says instead of all these presumptions that are thrown around. Mm. So I mean, and, and there's a few cases on Facebook where they've uh, they've had brothers that you've seen openly have successes on the basis of what the law can do. On my end of this, on this schematic, is a bit different. I use it for accounting and ledgering purposes. I don't do it like the law, the the, 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 the ones that exercise the law. I do it in such a way that if one is accountable, if the taxpayers want to pay for it, sure, no problem. But if they really don't want to pay for it, they don't have to. Mm -hmm. So your prison stay may come up short because the taxpayer doesn't want to quote unquote pay. And if you have enough of them saying the same thing, then a release of a prisoner is imminent. And I'm talking, uh, I'm not talking large numbers. I'm talking about enough numbers to threaten the system. Mm -hmm. And if the system feels threatened, it will, it will regurgitate <laughs> uh, the, the, the specimen in which it consumed. And, and then of course we, they think that life will go on. Of course, Hoping that we don't acknowledge our success and continue to to deploy their uh, their entities out to consume us, and then of course we fall back asleep and dilapidate into a into a, a nationless people. Mm. Do anything we're told and uh, work for whoever uh, has the has the uh, has the most money. Right, right, right. So, with the process that you're speaking about, would you consider that? to be sovereign, because, you know, that's a phrase that you've heard a lot going out into, you know, just 
you know, uh, 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 the air as far as, you know, I'm sovereign. So when I go to court, you know, I got my sovereign rights, you know, it's constitutionally based, et cetera, et cetera. Would you consider that as such? Well, here's, here's a few problems. First of all, do you know where they borrow the, where the United States borrows the money from? The Federal Reserve, private bankers. Right. And, and, and guess where the private bankers get their power from? From fiat. <laughs> No, Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution, which allows Congress to borrow money. So what it means is, if you say, I'm sovereign, I have constitutional rights, what you're in fact saying is, is that the Fed can print money, tax the people to use against me, uh, primarily for collections purposes, Mm -hmm. mainly because I'm an agent of the federal government, because I want to benefit from the same thing. It's a a double language. In other words... I'm saying I have a constitutional right. Say I want to use Article 1, uh, freedom of speech. But then I say Article 2 uh, shouldn't be there because I don't think people should have guns. Here's the thing. Do you want to be a sovereign individual saying that I have a First Amendment right, a freedom of speech? Or do you want to be able to say and deny the Second Amendment and say you can't have your guns? Mm. You can't be a sovereign and a citizen at the same time. It doesn't exist. And the most important part is because the Constitution allows them to borrow money, that means if they're borrowing fiat, that means every dollar in your pocket is lent to you. So if it's lent to you, then you're borrowing money. You're effectively the extension. You're almost an agent to the federal government spending their money to raise revenue for all these obligations that they pass into law uh, and put all these agents in the street to collect for. I mean, if they co- if they take my car, they repossess my car, they, they take my house, and everything that I have dissolves in the court, what they've done is they've taken the assets that is necessary to keep the treasury open. Mm. And if my money is producing that because the United States is lending me the money, now am I sovereign? How could you possibly be independent of an entity they're subscribing you to the same thing that you can't alienate one parcel of a particular constitutional right and then begin to use other parts of it to make it consistent with what you're claiming. You, you, you can't do one. Of, you can't do both. Okay. <laughs> That's why they have the teeter totters uneven, because one side is going to be uneven with no equity and the other side is going to have the equity of law. And the equity of law typically is, is the thing that outweighs the balance of negotiation. So if I'm at the table saying I don't have anything. My wife has all the money. They're going to say, we're not going to negotiate with you because you don't have equity. I'm an inequity. She Mm. is inequity. So she has a means of producing commerce. So Mm. why would they negotiate with me? That's why they had to take, for instance, they had to take black man out of commerce because the time they did that, they can go back to the woman and say, hey, what do you want to do with your community? Because if we got him doing it, we have a problem because now we have him competing with us for power, which we don't want to extend to him. Because if we give it to him, well, then that that pretty much dilapidates my relationship in manipulating you. Mm. And if I don't have any control over you, well, damn it, I, I'm I'm not doing my I'm not doing good works. <laughs> right. I'm here to run you people, not not negotiate with you. <laughs> so to run you, they have to cause a, a sort of uh, manufactured fear that women would uh, uh, would basically do what they're told and then manufacture the same system that was put in place once before um, and telling their children, you know, their male children, they have to be more feminine to really uh, to really be seen. And, you know, and you've already eliminated the man because he's in jail or in prison. And then, of course, the females, they have to be strong uh, and, and, you know, uh, can can just absolutely do what she wants, but it's most important that she plays the role of leader, in a, not only in her household, but uh, in the future, simply deny any access to the man's uh, means of producing equity. Unless, of course, he is absolutely outstanding. I Meaning he's got to be able to show that he has the, the military mind, he has to have the intellectual mind, and he has to be able to do, uh, do things that most men typically don't do, which is go out and, uh, don't get me wrong, uh, most men are trying to fight for the right of being what they are, what they're supposed to be. You know, they're supposed to go out and get a paycheck. They're supposed to come home and, 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 and take care of the family. But at the end of the day, you know, if you got a woman saying, no, <laughs> you have no control at this table, uh, then you're going to, ma- you're going to manufacture, you're manufacturing a man 
uh, with a woman, uh, with a woman, with a woman, with a woman's agenda. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's what we're seeing not only in the neighborhoods and the communities that we're we're, we're involved in today, uh, but it's it's something that has kind of evolved uh, since we've uh, we kind of let go of the reins during the '60s and '70s and '80s, and we just kind of took a back seat and decided, okay, we got. Uh, we really got this this uh, this thing on the table for civil rights. So technically, they're supposed to give us jobs. Technically, they're supposed to do this, that, and the other. And then you you got uh, the Nixon industry that it basically said benign and neglect sounds like a great idea, which is just basically just blindly ignore them uh, in every sense of the word because you know these riots are unnecessary. So let's just pretend this they don't exist. Mm. And since then, we've uh, we've kind of we've kind of faltered into the default of that process and uh we we don't recognize one another that's for certain and therefore uh our competition <laughs> the foreign representation that does not represent your community uh is eating you inside out it's almost making you consume yourself in order to become someone in something mhm mhm so so going to go back just a little bit in light of what you're just speaking God and you mentioned how sovereigns and citizens can't coexist. Is that anything in relation to the 14th Amendment where they created a, a new citizen um, after the Emancipation Proclamation and, and they pretty much created like a, um, um, a, a, you know, a warehouse receipt through the different licensures and, and, and the certificates that came about? Is that something you're referencing? Let me try to make it easier for you. When they signed the bill in Congress, did you sign that bill? No. Then it doesn't represent you. You saw that. that you saw that statement that I made. Uh, that little letter I put on my Facebook page. Right. right? Yeah. Anybody that wants to look me up on Facebook, it's facebook.com forward slash p h i l l i p g i l o n. That's one L in my last name. That letter basically says. If I am on your budget item line, that means if I have agreed to the terms and conditions of what you are spending this money for, then you're telling me that I'm accountable for the money you're spending. So if that's true, then I can use that money to pay my bills. Hmm. If not, then the application is nullified. That means that anything that I'm liable for via that law, since I'm not, if I'm not signing, if I didn't sign up with your mortgage, why would I pay your mortgage? Right. I mean, I mean, doesn't it make sense? Perfect. So whether whether or not it was the forefathers that signed the bills, or the or the or the people today that have industrialized the entity called the United States into a into a a, a, more, a metamorphosis of uh, of a uh, Fortune 500 company, if this company, this corporation we call the United States, is in fact a company, and we all know that is, I, I got all the tax identification numbers for the states, counties, and municipalities. No, 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 I'm not going to say city, counties, and municipalities. I don't have all of them, but I have a good majority, okay? And what I mean is uh, some of the major cities we, 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 we practice and we live in. There's something very, very symbolic about the idea of someone being sovereign. One, you have to be independent from a state. And then most importantly, you have to have a state of your own in order to be right. sovereign. Right. That's the most important thing. If I'm not signing my own bills, if my representatives aren't signing my bills, then they do not represent me. If I pay a city tax or a county tax or let's say I go to the store, okay, I have to have authority from the IRS to tell them I'm exempt. But if I show them that I turn my money into credit, they can't charge me a tax for credit. You can't charge me for credit because I'm on a, I'm lending my own money to you. Not the opposite way around. The Fed lends us the money. But if we're not lending money to the Fed, then what's happening? They're putting interest on commerce, which is how much money they'll be able to use to accelerate the economy over a specific amount of time. This is the reason why they can put bonds and subcontracts and things of this nature, because they're manufacturing the way to labor and, 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 and courting the contractors into producing capital for the federal government. So that means that for every dollar we pump in there, we want you to make 60 cents. We want you to make a quarter. We want the Negro to make five, uh, five cents, but we want to make $3.45. And including with interest, we want to ensure that if we don't capture this particular market, because we have foreign representatives that want to make more uh, money as well, and we have domestic investors that want to get in on it. Uh, if we're not looking at $7.80 every year on every dollar we spend on you, uh, then we got to put you out of business. 
This is the reason why you have bubbles and things of this nature, because inflation goes up on the basis of people not having enough equity, and then therefore the prices have to go down because they have to use up everything that they gave you. So everything they gave you, legally free, free and clear of any title, now is to be taken back because the Fed now has to ask the Treasury uh, to see if the taxpayers will bail them out for debt that they accelerated and extended to people that would that ultimately had no equity. You know, folks that basically don't have jobs, don't have uh, availability to credit, uh, people that could not uh, do uh, proper business, presenting themselves as, as as someone that can produce commerce and, and dominate a particular sector in order to pay their bills and then ensure that the artificial entity, the United States, is getting paid. Hmm. So how could you possibly, that's, that's another reason why, how can you nullify one section of the Constitution and then say the rest of the, the, rest of the Constitution applies to you? You, 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 now, don't get me wrong, you can waive certain parts, absolutely, but you can't waive an entire clause where it is consistent with the entire Constitution. Right. Right. You know what I'm saying? If it says that sentences are subjects, and even though it's not in the item lines of each particular section, it applies to the entire contract. So if it says subject citizen, it means every section has a, has a subject in which a citizen is going to be subjected to. Even though it doesn't say it, this is another. This is another reason why it's kind of hard to read laws because these are these are these are um, uh, these are what they call invisible contracts. These are things that you don't see but are literally right in front of you. When they ask you, "Do you have a constitutional right?" They, you say yes. That's a general application. That's a general agreement. So a general agreement means that if one section you have claimed, then the entire constitution you're claiming. Hmm. This is the reason why people don't listen to me. They're like. You're bursting my bubble. You're taking my concept away from me. No, I'm not. I'm telling you that your your concepts are failing because the United States only reciprocates and negotiates with with instrumentalistic entities and corporations. Other than that, unless you're negotiating as a company collectively, then you're going to have a hard time. Hmm. That's very interesting. So, so how would one go about getting into that instrumentality and, and, and having interest? you know, and, and, and negotiating power. How would one go about going into getting into that process? Well, the number one, the, the, the one, the number one attribute of having any contract that will be used by a group is that everyone has to sign the same obligation. They have to sign. If, if everybody's going to sign up the, after what you just got done saying at the very beginning, which I'm not going to lie, I got on and got lost in the sauce. As soon as you start talking, when I hear something like that, I say, okay, I have to do what it's called. I have to co-endorse it. That means I have to believe it. I have to feel it. I have to understand it. So since I co-endorse it, I believe it. I understand it. I have to sign it. So let's say um, you go into a meeting, okay? This is how I was able to get rid of agents. I got rid of them real quick. They come in, and this is when I was doing lectures. I say, come on in, and the uh, first thing I need you to do is sign this Constitution. They say, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what for? I'm like, oh. Because this will ensure that if you are a constitutionalist, anything you do in here is, is, is ensuring a contract. You're ensuring a contract between all of us that if anything happens, you fail to uphold the Constitution, we can collapse you, meaning we can collapse this contract and consolidate you into our entity. In other words, it's, it's kind of like we're buying the right to everything you do. Mm. You buy a house, we own it. You buy a car, we own it. Wow. You go borrow some money, we own it. If you negotiate with the Treasury, we own it. If you work for the federal government, we own it. <laughs> if you have an office and you're doing business as a subcontractor, if we go over and talk to them and say, "Hey, we, we, we took the equity out of this out of this this Constitution," he's liable to us. Well, they say, "Oh, okay, no problem. We'll cut the check to you. You're, you're not walking away from us anymore." <laughs> In other words. Those that are in equity, that means that the group has agreed to the terms and conditions of, con of consolidating power, pulling something away from the interests of uh, the, the state, away from the city, away from the counties, away from the municipalities, and away from the federal government. When you're saying that you're going to use your power in a constructive sense, when you're all co-signing and endorsing the same beliefs and benefits, one can take a corporation, take uh, uh you, you could take uh, you could take fifty people and run an entire city if you can get them all to co-endorse the belief that you exist, that your city exists, mm. just simply because it exists. And then all of a sudden, 
when they're no longer under the idea and the auspice of another entity that used to exist, you've now consolidated power because that entity now no longer receives the benefits that they once had. Hmm. And as long as it's sustained long enough, the entity will turn around and dissolve. It will have to. And then you can consolidate it into what you have created. But everybody has to, they don't, everybody doesn't have to believe what you're doing. What they have to know is that their children isn't going to get killed in the street. Right. They're not going to have to worry about over, uh, uh, overwhelming police presence. They're not going to have to worry about the, 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 the uh, sheriff kicking in their door and taking their taking their children and locking the house down. They don't have to worry about um, uh, the marshals coming to knock on their door because they don't have ju- any jurisdiction. If you're using the, the state laws properly, the feds can't even come into your town or your city or municipality. So that the Tenth Amendment. And then say what is that the Tenth Amendment as far as state power? No, what I'm talking about is a referendum. A referendum okay. kind of tells all, it tells the entire group of people, let's vote on this, vote this out of existence, and vote this into existence. Some municipalities have, have do, do, they sometimes do that to ratify agreements that they don't want with certain companies that they know have kind of put the tentacles into its entity, and, it, and it's losing power. That, in other words, it's losing real revenue. So it'll say, okay, uh, uh, this this uh, entity's association with us is, is starting to make us look bad. Let's do a referendum, vote uh, vote their contract out, and bring this new entity in because we'll we'll get a more favorable contract. Right. This is of exactly the type of thing that the people can do. Vote the entire city or county or municipality out of existence. So this is a matter of, of contracting. Existence. These are these are high contracting right. powers. Right, right, and that's the only way you're going to be able to negotiate your way out of something and creating something of your own. And most importantly, um, uh, the members of society has to agree to the terms and conditions that things may get bad for a little bit. You, you, you know, you, you may have uh, uh, certain entities that are absolutely not going to do business with you, which will then cut off certain surpluses that the city might have once had at some point. And after that, you know what happens after that. You're going to have to create it on your own. You're going to have to now turn around and create the leverage of your creation power and begin to take on uh, take on the existence uh, of what you what you have ultimately uh, what you're ultimately telling the people is beneficial for them and beneficial for you at the same time. Matter of fact, uh, you can have a general council and run an entire city. Now the statutes only apply to what the city wants to do. If you say we want to vote it into uh, an, an unincorporated area, uh, you don't need a, a city manager. You don't need a mayor. You just need a city council. Mm. You have a municipal council. Matter of fact, you can make it so large that the only uh, the, the only ones that aren't voting are children. And to make it so that by proxy, everybody agrees to terms and conditions, and therefore their vote counts. And anything that happens, council moves on something, uh, maybe you don't get a majority on a particular bill. Then you know what happens? You got to go back to the drawing board. But that's just how politics work. But if everybody agrees to it, and they're saying, "Hey, these jobs are available to us. Hey, our capital that we produce is available to us. Uh, we may be given a percentage to the state, but 100% of our revenue comes back to us in the base of creating, uh, creating, uh, an in, uh, not only a financial environment, but a study where." Um, those that would have exercised to, to find cheaper services elsewhere to make money where they, they think that they'd be more productive would stay exactly where they are, stand firm on the principle that by the time the outside world begins to recognize you, you're already in the profit. That's how your Black Wall Streets popped out of nowhere because they were doing something so profitable amongst each other, no one was really watching. When they finally figured out what happened, they said, oh, ooh, they got it way too much money. They have way too much access to what they're doing and they're producing and they're and they're they've dominated their own industries and we have no control over it. Mm. Therefore, we have to dissolve it in a violent way. <laughs> that was the only way it today now, that would never happen. With with with, with, with Tulsa, happen. did they have a political machine like their um industrial Absolutely machine not. with their politics? Absolutely not. That's so that 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 created a problem for them, then, huh? That was one of the problems why it got liquidated. Well, here's the thing: when you're talking about uh, a city being sieged by bombs and things of this nature, you're telling you're telling the world that the mayor's complicit. The mm-hmm. city county, well, they didn't have at that point they didn't have counties; they had a uh, uh, city municipals, which right. was a very general, it was a very general area. So 
uh, uh, surprisingly, Oklahoma compromising Black Wall Street uh, was, in fact, an outsourced game. Anything that came to the city was, you know, that was brought in from the Negro was considered uh, um, uh, first pickings. So we gave the best, what they thought was the best to them. We actually kept the best because we had everything from pianos uh, to, 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 to everything everything that would articulate a, a fashion statement that put us at a level equal to those in prosperity would have seen us uh, uh, versus anyone in the city and said, wow, you guys are doing well. What's wrong with those people in there? And we'd just say, hey, they went to war. Uh, they came back with raw material. We used it. Uh, we industrialized. We kept it inside of our, our, our limits. And uh, we sell them what they think is the best. In reality, we got the best things that's popping. I mean, you can come over here. We got everything from music. Um, we have education. We have schools. We have industries. Uh, we have hospitals. We have control of our environment. And this was something that could not, that it was just too conniving for any outsider to, to take a poke at and say, nah, that can't be true. And when they really saw that it was true, they said, yeah, we're going to have to kill these people. Mm. This is non-negotiable. <laughs> we can't talk about how to dissolve them. We're just going to dissolve them, and that's just that's the bottom line. No one wrote it into any laws. Uh, no one wrote a policy against it. They just simply snapped and said, send, you know, send some napalm over there, uh, make it look like uh, some type of race issue. You know, somebody whistled at a white lady, uh, and therefore we bombed them out of existence. That's mm. just, a, you know, we're not going to go out and string out people because we can do this, uh, we can do this in, in three days. Right, more efficiently, so to speak. Before, you know, we'd be, you know, it'd be, it'd be shots fired and we'd, we'd fight for three or four months. Uh, and eventually we'd be overridden by the federal government who would eventually send in troops, uh, take our guns in and tell us, you know, kick us out of town. Mm. But they just bombed us. And that was it. Right. This was during the Depression years, too, wasn't it? Uh, around around that time, well, actually, uh, more more so going into going towards the 40s. Uh, these these uh, these particular type of wall, Black Wall Street setup setups were completely uh, me, well established before the Depression. So Depression didn't really exist unless you were outside a pledge to uh, outside communities to work for them uh, for what you would have gotten as a dime in the city. You would have gotten a quarter. Uh, in the quote unquote Negro, uh, the Negro community, as they called it. Right. On that note, let me ask you this question. You, 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 I know you're familiar with the phrase, and I forgot who the individual that said it, but he says, never allow a crisis to pass without seizing an opportunity. So, with that, during, you know, recessions, during repressions, um, the seven year cycles of, of economic, you know, uh, fluctuations, how. With the information that you have, how, how would you go about insulating yourself during these particular these times as far as maybe like so some people got furloughed in 08. I got furloughed, actually, um, without pay. How would you go about insulating yourself and ensuring that you can have all your needs met despite the economic downturn? Taxation with representation. Those are the only words you need to know. It's, it's that simple. Taxation with representation, meaning if you took the tax code out of the mouths of those that are fed off of it and begin to regurgitate it back to your own interests, you would never, you would never, ever lose a job. You would never lose an opportunity. Everything you did would be revenue-based. That means you can literally grow an economy within a, within a, within the nastiest a communities you can possibly pick. You can say, okay, Sasha of Chicago, what, you, what can you do with it? Let's make them believers. We get a good portion of this particular sector, wall it off, we'll build it, and within six, uh, I'd say the six and a half to nine months, the community will no longer be blighted. You will have uh, people uh, that realize the job opportunities are available, and those that are in the sector who are then deprived of the outside uh, world, that means if you want to stay insulated from violence, criminality, things of this nature, almost like it's reverse brainwashing. I'm telling you, and I'm showing you, that by staying here, you can go anywhere afterwards. But if you build this, this is somewhere you can come and stay, and you don't have to worry about the outside world. Mm. If you got a job available for you, coming out of, uh, coming out of doing a, uh, a two-year bid, 20-year bid, uh, 
shit. You, you, you got on appeal and and you're 70 and need a job. Taxation with representation means that when your money's coming back to your community, old people would be facilitated with jobs. Mm. I'm talking about the insulation is solely based on the money revolving in the community, which is again they took, for instance, they took uh um they took uh the the free food services that we had before with using donations, but we wrote them off. The IRS didn't did not know about deductibles at the time. They did not use the deductible system. Because it was plus to minus. So they got into long division and said, you know what, that sounds like a great idea. They stole that from us and began to use what is called now the welfare system, which would allocate the money that are being that are being taken out of the men's pocket, given to the women. And then they, quote unquote, say this is a desirable effect in the communities that are financially unable to uh, pr- uh, present an unorthodox practice that can be incorporated into the way city, counties and municipalities will treat their inhabitants. Mm. So if they're doing that, <laughs> we're not producing anything. I'm talking about something that, that's for free. If you go and pay uh, for toilet paper, okay, at Walmart, and that sales tax come back to the community, if that sales tax comes back to the community, you, you, it, the local stores that come back, the mom and pops come back, and then they develop into. And they, you remember when you're quarantined in a, a quarant, uh, quarantine in a quarantine in a market, you can't compete against each other in such a way that you're not playing favorites among each other because Walmart would beat you out if you're not playing favorites among each other. Hmm. And when you start playing favorites among each other, Walmart no longer exists. Walmart has to dissolve. Some cases they put Walmarts in certain areas where we are prosperous, so they can z- dissolve all the uh, the the markets that were necessary for us to thrive on, and then forced us to go to the city when we thought that Walmart was cheaper. Started working for them, they turned around and said, "Oh, nope. You know what? We're going to move back towards the city. So you're going to have to come all the way out here." And then what did that do? That took the influence out of those that can produce jobs. That took the influence out of the, the possibility of growth within the community, and then it it, it dismantled the system of independence. Mm. So if I'm downtown spending my money at, at 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 Macy's, and I'm not dealing with the uh, the brother man down the block from where I live that produces the same material, the same things, and makes it authentic because the source in which he's producing it from are from the same people that look like us, even though he's from Macy's. At the end of the day, the money is in the community. Mm-hmm. Not because he's buying it for Macy's. Eventually, when he dissolves his relationship with Macy's, the community is going to provide for themselves. That means you can go buy the raw material from people that ultimately benefit you most. Mm. So that that is uh, that's my way of saying uh, our, our relationship, uh, our relationship now and any time down the line is solely based on what we tax each other for. Mm-hmm. And, and the most important part is. If we tax each other, we represent our own interests. That means you, I don't have to pay for something that the city can provide me with and which I can give to you and now you can provide the community with. And therefore, every time you spend your money at my store and my money's coming back to you to go out and facilitate what ultimately is necessary for the community, that money comes right back to me because the, the, the same people you're providing a service with are benefiting from my store who are ultimately spending money here to unproduce the job you need. So I need a system to me how to do that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Powerful. You're listening live to Hebrew Vision. I'm here with Professor Phil Gillen. We're discussing politics and money. If you have a question that you want to call in and, and ask Professor Phil a question, you can call in on our, our line at 701-801-1211. Our PIN number is 760-976-533. So let's transition and talk about your company, brother. I believe it's Zeptepi, if I'm not mistaken. So talk about Zeptepi, what it is that Zeptepi does. No, we, we won't talk about that per se right now. What we'll talk about is politics and money. The only reason why I say politics and money is because it derives from the basis of what Zeptepi is trying to do. Okay, no doubt, no and doubt. As a matter of fact, let's, 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 put it, let's, put, let's, let's put it simpler. Um, uh, if you petition... Uh, an agency, an entity, or someone private in the sector that produces capital. If your money's being spent with them, why aren't your interests back in your community? That's mm-hmm. what Zetepi says. Politics of money has a has a different look on that. And the reason why I'm I'm not spending on Zetepi right now is because Zetepi is in a development stage. The only reason why I say that it's not important right now is because 
when it's in its development stage, infancy is something that I can't feed a child a steak. <laughs> right, I understand. <laughs> this is a steak, and the, uh, the people aren't ready for that. Okay, it has to have its leadership established. T- to throw it out there is kind of to say to the to the real wolves, "Wow, food." <laughs> so I don't want to throw that out there quite yet. But um, to give you a roundabout, I guess you could say, is that um, uh, in general, uh, politics and money, debt tepi, and several of the interests that I've been involved in, the sole pro- uh, uh, propriety of using taxes and using contracts to facilitate our way out of these, uh, these entities is to basically finance and underwrite our privilege, okay. our benefits, our national surplus our grievance to be included, but to include ourselves in, in such a way that when our growth is large enough that recognition is almost impossible. It, it's impossible to deny. You can't deny me something that I have already. Mm-hmm. If you deny that I can't uh, buy a, Bug- a Bugatti from you, uh, I just bought it from the brother down the street. So if I'm buying it from him, I think that it's in your best interest not to be uh, ignorant. Uh, your false smiles and false hopes and making me believe that you like me uh, is almost, it's irrelevant now. And now that I've staged uh, a bit of a, a takeover, uh, not only am I recognized by the people that I'm involved with, but the people that are involved with, uh, involved with uh, the interest of ensuring that we're protected and we're insulated from the possibility of collapse and, and this criminal enterprise that's running everything else uh, to kind of, to kind of classify ourselves uh, as a as a as a, a, a tribalized cult or whatever is going to be the likes of the, of the, the 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 names will be called just as they, they may have said uh, to you and a few other Hebrew Israelites like you know y'all can let us in uh, you're not so important because we're just as important as you it's, it's almost like saying all lives matter when the only people that are dying are people that don't look like the people that are that are that are uh, disenfranchised from it. Right. So our debts and franchise based on it. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, uh, I, let's just say that in a roundabout sense, every entity has a, has its own structure. Mm-hmm. Incorporating people's money is the main objective. Incorporating your money means that now you're spending your money for yourself, with yourself and others. Now, I may get a small little portion, just like if I was a, a city mayor or a council member or something like that. I'm getting a little bit of money because I'm producing what I project to be an, an isolated an isolated possibility where incidents of our collectiveness is going to guarantee a revolving line of credit. Money comes to me, I take a little off the top. I, you know, that's the law because we're talking about the fact that we're engineering a system that we can be so sufficient and we don't have to ask everybody else for money. You know, I'm going after your brothers that, that may have never listened to me, you know, wanted to go buy a school, wanted to do this, that, and the other. And, and you know, I know I'm mostly going to say, oh, you're talking about Umar Johnson. Yeah, the Umar Johnson. There's other brothers that are out there trying to do the same thing. I've talked to many of them, and I said, you don't need money to an aid school. Mm-hmm. You don't need money to do a lot of these things because a lot of your own money is in your pocket. You're giving money to the district. Uh, through taxation, they represent their own interests as they come back and say, okay, we'll build a small school for you, and we'll put these inferior books in there. Now, don't get me wrong, we're trying to help you, but in the end, you're paying for it, and you don't benefit from the same things that other people uh, in their communities are benefiting from, you know, real education. Now, I'm not talking about the fact that they may lie to their own their own constituents. They may lie to their own children. They may be giving them books of fantasies. But at the end of the day, wouldn't you want your child to feel and think and, and advocate freedom as you might have wanted to if you were a child? Right. I think so. So yeah. that's where I'm at with that, is that, uh, uh, like I said, it, 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 each entity has its own mission statement. But politics and money is strategically uh, after and writing up these documents to facilitate this 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 new brand, this that Tepe thing that's going to hopefully corner uh, huge marketplaces in each city. Uh, everybody would have their own council. Everybody would have their own leadership. I don't want to rule everything. I do not. No, what I want to do is I want to keep the, the domains of these entities so that I can subscribe to a, a freedom, a, a feeling of freedom when I come to your town, when I come to your city, when I come to your municipality. I want to know that my, when I get off the plane, I'm greeted by my own. <laughs> right. When I go downtown, I see people with, with, with boutiques and shops and beautiful places uh, uh, to eat at, and I don't have to worry about someone uh, uh, 
you know, resenting me because of my color or my 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 disdain for uh, uh, the fact that they don't have anyone that works in there that looks like me. I mean, I just simply uh, I, I've always seen it like this. If I don't see my reflection in the mirror, uh, growing in a, in a in a in a dominant way that all of us would see our children and our children's children grow in some way, shape, form, or fashion, uh, then um, you know, who are we looking at? Yeah, indeed, indeed. We just had a Who's caller call in um, or ring in. Caller, do you have uh, a question or can you state your name or, or do you have a question that you just want to ask Professor Phil? Hello? Caller, you there? Hello, caller, are you there? Peace. Peace and blessings. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You have a question from Professor Hello? Phil, Brother Rashid? Hello. Peace. Peace and blessings, brother. Oh, yes. Uh, I was just, was, was just listening to what Brother Phil was speaking about on the process. Hello? Can yes, you sir. Hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, finish your thought. Yeah, I, I can hear you fine. Yeah, go ahead, bro. Hello? I, I can hear you, bro, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I can hear you. Hello? Yeah, brother Rashid, go ahead, we can hear you yeah, loud and clear. My phone or whatever. Yeah, hello. Yeah, yeah I was just listening. I was just something. I'm sorry, my brother, go ahead. No, I, I said you might have hit mute or something like that. Go ahead, bro. We listen. Okay. Okay. No, I was just really just listening to um, what you guys were, were speaking about with the process um, on using the system. You know what I mean? Like you were saying, um, Brother Phil, you know what I'm saying? Back for, um, with his own, you know what I mean, legal document the correct way instead of, you know what I mean, running around here circle so you know I really didn't know if you could break it down a little bit more for me That's what exactly what part or, what part of it is, are, are you are you misunderstanding how, how, that, how that would go uh, how, how a contract would, would be able um, to no, I understand everything I would, okay. just, I would just liquidate like a uh huh yeah Liquidation. You mean you mean like to dissolve something? You mean with that? Okay. How, how does it work when you dissolve an? Okay. How yeah, you dissolve yeah, an entity? Exactly. You mean? Okay. Well, let, let's look at uh, uh, every state has uh, what's called. Uh -huh. a, uh, you got a lot of noise over there, bro. I'm sorry. I'm gonna go ahead and mute you real quick, brother Rashid, till he gets his question. Okay. Go ahead, brother. Um, he can hardly hear you. Go ahead, Professor Phil. Okay. Okay, well, every state, every city, every county, every municipality uh, has in this arsenal a, 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 disil a disillusion, uh, a disillusion of entity on hand. If you went into the, the, the city treasury, county treasury, municipal treasury, the state treasury, and asked them, "Can I have an application to dissolve an entity?" Uh, if you have the tax identification number of the city, county, and municipal, or even the state. To dissolve them is to tell everyone else to say, we no longer need their services. We no longer need their uh, their pr the prisons. We no longer need their foods. We no longer need their products. We don't need nothing from them because we can produce it from our for ourselves. And but the, by dissolving, what I mean by uh, 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 dissolution is the same principle of marriage. When you marry a woman, uh, you go before a, uh, a documented entity agent uh, called a judge. And he subscribes you to a lifetime full of happiness. Uh, and, and of course, even if you go before a um, you go before a um, uh, a church, okay. So you go to the Hebrew church, you get you get married, and uh, unless you take the doctrine extremely serious, and you'll actually kill your wife, or your wife will kill you, uh, <laughs> to essentially ensure that the marriage is complete per se by contract. Uh, and then what I mean by contract is doctrine. So if you're running by the doctrine, uh, this ain't for the psychos. This is <laughs> for people that think realistic, 
realistically that know that you know that's just wrong. This is no longer the middle. You don't. This is not a medieval art. This is uh, this is this is uh, this is a relationship between two people that have agreed on the terms and conditions of what they signed up for. So when you get that marriage license. What you've done is the marriage license is equivalent to opening a new company. So, I'm at, so imagine you just open a company with your wife, and everything that you do contract work under goes under your company name. So she goes under your company name because you, you're now uh, the um, you're the applicant to all of her commerce. Of course, they want the man to lead. So that one thing you guys do have right, the man should lead. Uh, I agree with you on the uh, on that particular principle. But when it comes down to dissolving the relationship, you're actually saying that I no longer want to be in marriage or in bondage uh, with this individual because it is it is no longer uh, deserving, beneficial. It's no longer exchangeable. There are nothing. There's nothing in escrow that would ensure that both of us would benefit uh, the relationship. And because of the type of circumstances or situation set up uh, that has never really brought us. Uh, to a light of inspiration, a, a light of guaranteeing that both of us would prosper under it. Uh, the auspice of dissolving something is solely based on telling the state, hey, we no longer have business. I no longer want to do business with them, and therefore by divorcing the entity, you're divorcing your relationship with what ultimately you would have benefited from, which is really nothing. You don't have anything to lose. But you're now able to now create your own thing, and everyone that comes under it uh, creates literally a foreign jurisdiction. It's in, in every sentence of the word, it is sovereign uh, with a corporate capacity, and this corporate capacity is based on what kind of contracts you have uh, you've entered into among the people that are uh, that are courting your negotiations. If people are courting you, uh, they're ultimately saying that. Uh, I'm going to take this relationship to the next level, and both of us is going to benefit from it. That's what courting is. You know, if, you, if you're in a relationship, you're you're going to court a woman because this tells you uh, the, the equity that you may have, and this will show her the equity you may have. It, you, it may be just a beautiful smile and a and a, and, a, and, a, and and gorgeous eyes, and and and, and uh, for her it could be um, uh, the fact that, or I'm sorry, it could be you uh, that she's uh, she's um, she's a woman. <laughs> And that may just be enough uh, to create the equity of bondage. And the equity of bondage is just to agree that both of you, uh, remember we go back to the, the same uh, demonstration, uh, uh, Brother Ben, that, that if you didn't sign any of those bills, then those contracts don't apply to you. If you sign a, 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 a letter of marriage where both of you agree, uh, have agreed to it, that's under any statutory or premise that they can use against you, which is where all these other contracts come into play. And you're like, hey, I didn't sign up for that. But you don't understand that everything that conclusively has an arm or leg is attached to it. So it may not have state uh, state accountability from the federal government written all over it, but the state is using it as a benefit to extend, overextend their jurisdictional promise to guarantee certain benefits and rights that upon the dissolving of the marriage, she'll be given specific type of proceeds and would be guaranteed, even though they have, they really don't have jurisdiction over it, but they, that they're using the promise that both of you have agreed under state law and anything that comes from the federal government or comes from the city or states or municipalities, that they extend those particular uh, amenities to the individuals to not only dissolve it, but to make it beneficial for both parties. This is the reason why by dissolving a city, county, or municipal, you're basically saying that it's beneficial to ensure that by structuring it properly, the equity of all will be uh, uh, circumvented as a collective, and it's non-negotiable. Because everything that's written, uh, that's already written, based on the clandestine of the collective, will actually be the governing. That means they'll they'll govern themselves. They'll govern the collective. They will all agree to the terms and conditions. And if they do that, well, for the most part, you can prosper. Uh, you got that, brother Rashid? Can you hear us now? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And a lot of us, unfortunately. A lot of that enough. Now, here's the biggest problem we always have in the black community in general is that we always want to be either the leader or the leadership. This is a serious problem. I'd rather be in the back office negotiating with people of real power than to be sitting and negotiating with those that want power over me, uh, to subject me, subject me, subject me to their own ideology. Not because I don't believe it, but because if it doesn't benefit the collective, it's 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 really of no it's of no substance. 
So if you're independent and you have to do it your way, then you're really not going to get anywhere. You're really you're going to have a, a, a what I call a gothic cult like uh, cult like following, but that's all you're going to have. That's it. If I'm just gossiping on YouTube, talking about things that people should believe in, and they believe in me because I believe it, does it benefit them? Absolutely not. So it, there, there's there's absolutely no benefit in just discussing. It can be a discussion piece about what leadership should do, but at the end of the day, if we're not all acting as leaders and collectively agreeing to the, to the decorum of a collective, then you know we, we, every time we talk, we're in a dissolved marriage like. Equation. We're always saying that if you don't have equity, I'm not sitting at the table with you. You're saying if I don't have equity, you won't sit at the table with me. So it's like, well, where do we go from now? Where do we go from there if we're not if we're not equitable in all our ways, beliefs, and, and 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 ensuring that we all benefit from the same thing? If you're chasing the same dollar, why can't I turn around, spend it, and and it's coming back to you in the form of a job? I mean, what's the, what's the, what's the issue? Why can't we agree on one thing? I mean, it's just it's, it's bananas. I, I just you know. I can't fathom that it's it's a very simple concept. Yeah, I think for some, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, go ahead, I'm sorry, bro. Obviously, I just think for some, you know, the process may be easier to to comprehend. For others, it may take a little more, you know, because of cognitive dissonance or perhaps you know things like that, you know, and, and the level or the the lack of critical thinking that's not present amongst people. I think you know, for some, it, it may not be a simple process to understand. So, you know, as you say that, you know, we may have to simplify terms for others to make it more layman in a sense, you know, because, um, I can't, I can't hear you, bro. You got brother got all the noise in the background. That's just, right. I'm gonna put yeah. you back on mute, brother Rashid. Um, just saying, you know, for more layman terms, cause I think some of the terms you may use at times can challenge people if they don't have that particular, lexicon so to speak you know so uh uh it may be something you readily bam pick up because of your experience you know some may find that your vocabulary may present a challenge to them you know because there's some pretty technical words that you're using you know at times so i think you know just to to, to balance what you're saying where it may be more readily understood for some others aren't going to pick up on it right away just, just in, you know, in, in light of having, you know, your right, clear right, understanding right, you. of it. So just, you know, in, in light of that. So let me see if Brother Rashid has any more follow-up questions. I'm going to bring you off on mute, Rashid. Uh, are you there? Can you hear us now? He may have muted himself. <laughs> He's still on the line, though. But we are here live tonight in Hebrew Vision with Professor Phil Gillen. Um, we're discussing politics and money, and he's really just laying things out for us plain and simple as understanding how to really insulate ourselves and, and, and to become more uh, uh, equitable in our in our reality. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question, Brother Phil, because I, I think that this is something that w many people are well aware, aware of, well aware of, and that it's safe to say America is a pretty much bankrupt and solvent country, right? because of the, of the debt that she has accrued over the years. How do we leverage that understanding America's economic status? I think the main, the main, the main course of it is, is um, to try to make it as simple as possible is uh, how much, where can we control uh, the maximum amount, the maximum Contractual power with the least the least amount of repelled resistance. Meaning, can we go to a little Wayne and say, look, blindly, we already know you sign all these other contracts. We know you ain't got no sense to understand that you're being used as a pawn. But in the end, this will benefit the community. If you sign over, say, uh, uh, if you sign over something that ultimately would have been, and I know that Little Wayne sounds uh, absurd. I know that, you know, most are like, nah, that, that's impossible. It, it probably is impossible. It, it is, it is, it is. But just, you know, give it a little imagination. You go to him and you say, look, man, here's what we're going to do. You're going to spend money on all these ridiculous things. We know that. But if you sign here, what's going to happen is all your taxes that you spend is going to go back to the community. Now, you keep your music going. Matter of fact, we not only want to support it, we'll buy it. The reason why we want to buy it is because that money comes back to us no matter where we buy it at. Even though, the, even though based on consumerism, you know, 
the banks are getting fooled. The, the local businesses that we don't do business that we don't own uh, are doing good. But this recycles uh, a reciprocated financial art form. We're all looking for the money to come back. So the only way to put it in in context of controlling what is already dissolved, as, as the United States is, is just a, a broad entity uh, with tentacles and everything, is to be the redistribution of wealth. We have to think and act in a redistributing manner. We, we have, I have to say to you, and you have to say to me, I agree to the terms and conditions of me spending my money with you and my money coming back on the basis of what we agree on. Now, the U.S. government doesn't step in and infringe on these type of contracts. Because the United States already said in its own constitution, it will not infringe on uh, or impair contracts, or even the law of contracts. That means if a law is based on what all of us have agreed on, they can't turn around and say, no, we're not going to agree to that term and condition. We say, oh, no, right here. Mm -hmm. You you, you got an oath under this, right? Here you go. See your oath right here? You've agreed to that already. So anything that comes from what we're saying is based on what we're redistributing. So regardless of what we're saying, what's on paper that validates all our claims, that our benefits should be local and should be in our hands, we don't have to ask for that. I don't have to go downtown and ask for a grant. Hmm. You know, I shouldn't have to ask for a city job if the money is already on my side of town produced uh, at the same rate of producing the jobs that would be produced elsewhere that come over here and take the jobs away from the people that need them. So why would I continue to give my money to the same entity that disenfranchises my people? Why would I do that? Right, right. That make any sense at all. It makes no sense. That's deep. That's deep. So, lo- logic, logic is very logical. If we, if you, if I agree that I got, okay, I got a homeowners. I'm gonna give you an example. I got a homeowners association loan under FA, uh, um, FFA. Um, you know. F- FHA, I'm sorry. So I got a federal housing authority loan, and I'm asking that the person down here, you know, the Hispanics, are doing all the work grooming the land. Now I'm saying to myself, wait a minute. Now these young brothers over here ain't doing nothing. Hey, man, hey, shorty, come in for a minute. What's up, man? What's going on? Y'all like playing basketball, right? Yeah, man, yeah, man. You know, we, we play ball day. Okay. Well, let me ask you something. You want some new sneakers? Yeah, I want some new sneakers, man. Yeah, how about the job? If I gave you a job and you ain't got to approve, you ain't got to do nothing else but sign this right here, I'm going to go get this money. I'm going to have you down here grooming the lawns and making them look beautiful and nice and, and, and whatnot. What would you say? You say, man, you serious? Yeah, man, sign right here. Don't worry about it. You and all the shorties right here. So all the shorties signed up. I didn't go to their parents and say, hey, man, your kids say they're going to work for me. Well, I, oh, what? Yeah, they're going to work for me because you don't want to put them to work. Oh, hold up, brother. Now, hold on now. I ain't got no work. Okay, well, sign right here, bro. So, well, hold up. So, the same money I'm spending on homeowners association is going to wind up. Hold up. So, wait a minute. So, we paying the community to do this? Uh, brother, why do you want those people down there? Now, don't get me wrong. I know I, I, might, be, I might be seeming to be judgmental. Uh, it's pointing out the Hispanics as if, though, they're foreigners. But, unfortunately... They don't occupy the, the, the Negro space for the benefit of the Negro, as as an Hispanic would be the benefit of an Hispanic. It would be cons- it would be a consolidated language if we all thought the same. Like, okay, I'm gonna do for you and your community as you would do for me and my community. But because if that's not so, and it isn't, then I have to look at it from the standpoint of I'm, I'm putting him, I'm putting the Hispanic in as the as the just as the uh, as the uh, uh, as the as the as the point of reference of ensuring that those jobs would stay in the community, and once they do, the people that w- that come to our communities for those jobs are no longer there. Your child is now working. You're working, and now you have a developed community that now discourses its money from its pockets, use wherever it choose, and coming right back to those that facilitate the obligation of what's necessary for the community to grow. Hmm. So I, had, I, if I, I couldn't have made it any easier, I'd, <laughs> I'd have to say that I gave the process away. <laughs> right, 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 right. So, so you you brought that process up. Let's let's think about how it functions. What are the functionalities of this? The signatures, yes. The filing, where? How does the funds then come into the community? How does that take how do, place? How, how, do, how, do, how does how does the city work? When well, you when you spend money at uh, a, a safe dollar or a dollar stop or a dollar store or Walmart, any of these places, 
when you pull up pull up a receipt. Pull up a receipt. I don't know if I asked you to do this before. Pull up a receipt real quick. Um cuz I am gonna tell you I'm gonna tell you how this is the reason why this becomes uh and brother Rashid, you can throw it uh, if you if you got a receipt, you can throw yours in. I just want to know how much the tax was on that receipt. Cuz this will broaden your horizon to why we are having such a problem. Why this why being presented something that's so false that it begins to, in, in our mind, begins to be true because they effectively give you what you need. When in reality, they're giving you nothing. And, and they're, you know, in, in a sense, they're giving you a dime every quarter they give themselves. So you got a, you got a uh, receipt on you? And I'm, I'm talking about, about the city, the county, the municipal. Yeah, I'm about to pull up a sample out. one. I'm about to just pull one up and um, just read it off to you. No, just give me the tax amount. Give me the tax amount. Right, right, right. Um, they don't have one on that one. Let's see. Okay, here goes one. So. Let me see. It's not coming up. How, much is, how much is the tax on You got one, brother Rashid. I don't have one on me. I'm. I didn't even think about getting that. I'm looking right now. Hold on, let me. Let's just have. Uh... receipt that shows you how much you had paid at the, at the pump or at Walmart or at McDonald's or something like that. Right, just a regular store. So let's say, okay, this is an ABC Appliances, right? Let's say the total uh, came up... Uh, 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 uh. Like a, oh, okay, hold on. Let me, I, let me go ahead and read this here. So you got a subtotal right, of $1,177.99. There was a tax of $87.17 giving you a total of $1,265.16. So what you've done is, you, you, if you equate that to jobs and people spending that amount of money every day, you, you've given away probably, uh, if you're in a population of 100,000, times that, times 100,000 people in six months, and that's how many jobs you just threw to, your, to, to the wolves. You just gave them, you just gave them jobs. You gave them jobs. And that's based wow. on the representation. Mm-hmm. That that that's taxation that's with representation. Taxation. That, if you look wow. if, if you look at the at the back of if you look at the back when you go to DC, look at the back of people's uh, uh license plates and it says taxation. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a actually pull it up and put it on your page. Taxation without representation. It's it's literally and it's funny. Uh, the phrase actually was coined by jo- uh, James Otis in 1771, basically saying, in so many words, the British uh, are taxi- taxing us and not representing our interests. Right. That's exactly what we're doing. That's we're the American us Revolution. To tax us and not represent our interests. That's the whole revolution. That's what it was all over. There you go. So the whole point of it, and I'm gonna, I'm like I said, uh, okay. this is. This is this is the reason why this is the reason why unless you're and this is this is revolutionary. Don't oh, don't don't get it twisted. <laughs> if you stick your you stick your neck in this, uh, oh you 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 go you gonna have this is not somewhere the paranormal is gonna pop up on your doorstep. You you gonna have them people talking to you. Oh yes, this this is not like a uh, like a, a, a you know a, a smooch on the cheek and you get to live to talk about it. <laughs> it's nothing of that nature. Right. You're talking about being able to take an entire system uh, and re and redesign it as your own. Redesign it like literally, it looks exactly the way you okay. want it. Okay. There is no, there is no. They tell you what to do. It's what you tell you what you're going to do. 
Hmm. So it's non-negotiable. Bro, you getting all kind of texts, man. <laughs> Bro, it's going hot. Up. My phone should be blowing up like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, but that's how it works. So how have you de- uh, how how have you dealt with that how? that kickback? Because I know there's been a kickback. How how have you dealt with that personally? Oh, taxes. Oh, I turn my money in a credit. Wow. Anytime I go to anytime I go to a, a, a even though well, basically I did it with the bank and the banks, the companies. Hey, he's this is borrowed money, so he doesn't intend on paying taxes on it. And the reason I'm paying taxes on it is because taxes is not something that's taxable. Can't tax credit. Hmm. So you just have signature. You, you just things, you can't you, tax credit. You just you just put your Say signature what? on things and and you just move on. That's all you do. Well, no. Let's just say I I build them the proper way. I said I'm not uh, a taxing uh, a, a taxing component to what would be a constitutional benefit to any other entity that I find would wind up taking my money, uh, building the rest of the people, and then creating jobs on their behalf and giving me none in, in, in exchange for my money. You're not going to give me a job for it, so why, why would I why would I pay you? to do something that I can do. I, I can go in and, uh, um, um, uh, because I have access, everyone has access to uh, the, uh, uh, not garbage, but what is it called again? The, um, uh, geez, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, uh, the places where you could dump your garbage, for instance. You can go and do that. That's completely legal. You, you, you know, that you don't have to ask the city to come and take your garbage. Uh, your children could be taking your garbage to the city dump, paid the same way. Um, uh, what else? I'm trying to think of what else. I mean, th- there's just so many things that are based on tax. Schools, for instance, where I, when I came and met other brothers and said, look, you don't need money th- for schools because you can use taxes bonded over to your company and then borrow against it. Completely legal. You don't have to ask them for anything. But when you start asking them for things, what you're doing is you're telling them they have power. And when you do that, you might as well just go ahead and end your relationship of independence altogether. You might as well just forget about it. It doesn't exist. It's not going to exist. You're not going to benefit from this abstract belief system. This is solely based on uh, uh, this is solely based on who is going to control what grievances and financial attributes that come from what we're presenting toward each other to each other, presenting to each other, and then preserving as a means of recycling uh, our dollars, putting it into a system in which it comes back either 10 times fold. It can come back, uh, I mean, if you go to the Asian community, it comes back 31 times. If you go to the, uh, the Hispanic community, it, go, it comes back almost six times. Go to the Jewish community, it comes, I, I don't even know. I'm not going to sit and lie. <laughs> I think they keep their money, okay? <laughs> I don't even think they even spend any money, okay? <laughs> right. And then you have other communities with their money's coming back four and five times. And you don't see their neighborhoods where they, they need to call on people. They don't have to call on the city to come take their garbage. Some of them act, actually own and, and have even invested in these particular type of bond markets to guarantee that the jobs stay where they're facilitated and trade it. So I don't need your help. I don't need your assistance. So how, how often is this process used by others outside of the African-American, quote-unquote African-American community? Are, are others well aware of this and, 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 and exploit it to their benefit and interest regularly? I have, I have, I have absolutely been ignored at, at the experience of, of, of explaining this to uh, black folks in general. <laughs> it, is, it, has come to my, it has come to the conclusion that unless you are absolutely... Uh, uh, going to hand it to them, it, it's just simply not going to work. Not because uh, people aren't going to listen. It's because I haven't been, like, for instance, uh, what I had to do to you to get on the show, okay? That is something that would be foreign to others. They'd be like, what? How are you going to tell me what I can and can't do? It's because, um, unfortunately, <laughs> people like myself aren't exactly uh, aren't exactly appealing. I, I, I don't have the selling power. Or let's just say I don't dignify in- entertainment. I do this strictly by what uh, the principles of what the law says, how contracts are, are structured, and most importantly, uh, a means of being able to give our people a way out. But a lot of times the study... Uh, the, the, the fact that they have to take time out of their, out of their busy day and their schedule to take on something that they think isn't, 
isn't something they want to study or, or don't want to be involved in. It's like, do it for me, and I'll wait for you to get it done. And when you get it done, I'll be here. Yeah. I, you know, I'm waiting on you to produce it. So if I'm waiting on my people to produce something that I'm producing, you know, what, what's, the, what's the use? I mean, that's the case you know, in a lot of, our, of and, our movies. And I, and I don't mean it. I don't mean it in a mean way, but you know, let's be real. Right. The apathy is is very present. It's a it's a present issue that we do have. You know, uh, from the reparations movement. You know, everybody else wants to sit back and receive the rewards, but they don't want to do the work required to actually get the rewards. So right. I understand, and it's right. unfortunate. And, so that, and and that also and and that also comes with the fact that if any of them were doing this, if they were in fact seeing it as a benefit, then this wouldn't be this wouldn't be a, a, a marketable a marketable thing where I had to explain it to everyone. It'd be something you can pick up and tomorrow you can go and do. If if people were actually listening, like, okay, well, if you can do it, I can do it. It's not negotiable. The question is, is are you willing to pick it up and, and take it as your own? Are you going to uh, manufacture it so that it not only becomes your own, it becomes something that uh, has to be tolerated, it has to be acknowledged. Um, um. It goes it goes further than that, but I'm saying to be able to ensure that people are going to move forward, they have to realize their own potential is based on what they're going to do. If you don't produce, and you saw all the, the memes I put, if you don't produce anything, uh, then there's no equity coming your direction. It's just that simple. So if mm-hmm. you're waiting for someone to do something for you, you are, you are extremely mistaken on the principle that your own community could be doing something. But you have to develop something for the community to comprehend so that the community can reciprocate that that benefit so that they all can do the same thing. And it's not like you have to be the ruler of an entity. It's just you have to share the power among each other. That's all you got to do. That's it. If, if, if we all thought and acted like Hebrews, acted like Christians, acted like any group, if we acted the way we sponsor the things we believe in, then 90% of our problems wouldn't be commercial. Two percent would be, but ninety ninety eight percent of it wouldn't be commercial. It'd be the fact that if we can tolerate each other, there would be no need for a separation of power. You don't have to separate three entities so that they can subscribe to being subservient to each other and then make it beneficial to us. No, let us run it, and we can all balance. And we can all balance each other out by doing the right thing by each other. Then you don't need to be governed. The governed are the ones that that basically ask for someone to do something for them because they can't do it. So if you're governed, if you're saying, I need to be governed by the covenant, I need to be governed by the doctrine, I have to be governed by the people, I have to be governed by, and what I mean by people are people that are designed to control you, and I have to be governed by an entity, then just call yourself a slave. You might as well just call yourself right. exactly what you are. Right, a slave. right, <laughs> right. You put the master on you. don't need to go any other, you don't got to go that far to figure out what a slave is. If right. you agree to what they're saying, you are a slave. Right, right. It's just that simple. Indeed. We just had I a mean, caller. The making of a slave is someone that don't think for themselves. I'm sorry, go ahead, bro. No, I'm just saying we just had a caller um come in, 412 area code. Caller, can you announce yourself, please? Hi, it's Shelly Hawkins. How you doing, Sister Hawkins? Thanks for calling in to Hebrew Vision Live. Do you have a question for Professor Phil? No, I'm sorry I'm late. I just I forgot about it, and I do apologize. Oh, no problem. But I'm listening. I'm Listening. Okay, awesome. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for calling in. But go ahead and finish. You were just talking about, um, you know, as far as uh, uh, um, people wanting to be governed and not taking the responsibility to govern themselves, and that's that's ultimately what what even you know the standpoint and, and the perspective I come from ultimately is 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 the reality. I mean, I, I subscribe to anarchy personally, and that's just self governance. You know what I'm saying? So. You know, I, I definitely see the point that you make with that. But I'm going to let you go ahead and finish your thought, Professor Phil. Well, you know, you I mean, you don't have to be an anarchist if you all think the same. I right. mean, governed people think the same. If you all think the same, you don't have to, you don't have to go outside of that box. Mm-hmm. You don't have to go outside. That, that, that's, all, that's all about what you present as a collective so that no one else can act as the collective for you. And if they act as the collective for you, you know what's going to happen. You, 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 I mean... Anybody that wants some type of power knows exactly how they're going to act, how they're going to react, and how they're going to preserve uh, the natural way of life that they benefit from so often and that we deny ourselves access to. We deny ourselves. We, we just basically say, oh, 
Yeah, well, I mean, if you know how to do it better than me, then I'll just go ahead and let you do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, you know, what's that? What's that right there? What's that? And also, I post it on your page, so you, you should uh, you should recycle it, put it on other pages, and uh, send it to anybody and everybody that you you believe would uh, uh, would would be deserving of reading it. Which is, you know, like I said, taxation without representation. Very simple. They have a majority of the place in Washington D.C., which basically tells you exactly what uh, representation of of uh, and you'll notice even on the picket signs it says no sugar act, no tea act, uh, no stamp act. If it's an act, it's taxation without representation. <laughs> so they're saying something uh, during the time. And today they're like, you know, we're in a democracy which makes us free. Democracies cannot, they cannot exist as long as the republic wants to stand. Right. It's just that simple. You you can't have a republic in a, democ- in a democracy at the same time. You can't have a freedom entity and a entity that is uh that governs itself and doesn't give anything in exchange for its benefits to represent you it just doesn't exist it can't exist Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um in light of just the present political climate you know we're dealing with the new administration um you know and 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 a lot of different executive orders. There's been just, you know, uh, an amassing of the executive orders really going back to really like Reagan, you know, you could say, but of course it's been used throughout time. But but what do you think our community needs to be doing now? What can we do in order to further insulate ourselves um, for those, because I'm a repatriation, I subscribe to repatriation, but I, I do understand that for those who are here, you know, we need to find a way to have some buffers. What can we do um, right now to, to insulate ourselves and create a buffer zone in light of the current administration and, and the onslaught that's taking place in urban communities? Well, I'd have to say that, for one, most of the executive orders don't actually reflect uh, anything that would harm us. Now, that may sound crazy because a lot of the efforts of the Congress is really the sole basis of creating, of preserving its revenue status, which is to rule the world ultimately uh, with its contractual deceit and its, and its practice of war. But at the end of the day, it, it, to be honest with you, Congress does not have an effect on the black community as a whole right now. It is subjected to change and there are things that are going to come down the pipeline that are going to be absolutely disenfranchising. But ultimately, right now, um, the way this mon- this administration is run, um, uh, I'm like this. Until I absolutely know that we own and run a city, county, or municipal, because um, if if we run in, if we run a city, county, or municipal, we will run it like China, <laughs> the Great Wall of Silence, the Great Wall of of of, of uh, what I call the, the uh, deception conception, which is I'm going to give you something to believe, and as long as you can, uh, think that it's beneficial and you're going to take it as is, then, you know, I- I'll continue to feed you that until my economy has grown to the point that I can fight you off me. I can fend for myself. And that's what China did. It, 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 it gave the presentment of, uh, of an old, um, an old, uh, I call it, um, an old, uh, republic system of uh, of what we would call dictatorship, but in reality, as Russia did when when they come into democracy, they just change the look. They just change the look. Mm-hmm. I, if, if 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 someone outside of my community thought that my community was 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 beautiful and gorgeous and all that, you know what I would do? When someone that we know is undeserving of our community and could be a threat to us, I would make it look like the same thing that they authenticate as a source of what they claim that we are. Animals, junkies, all that. I would actually pull those people from outside of those walls, put them, insert them into a particular sector of town, allow those people to come in and photograph and talk about how how disturbing and disgusting the city is, and then let them roll out. Guess who feels that we're a threat at that point in time? No one. Mm-hmm. Right. They think that we're full of filth, that we're that we're, we're not we, we are not groomed, we're not doing anything that would ensure the, the prosperity of others, and therefore, really, we should just leave them alone. They don't look like they're doing. They don't. They don't seem like a threat. And that's what China did. They they built up this concept that they they eat people, they eat children, you know, do all this kind of stuff. Why 
while, all the while they're building their country. Hmm. So here it is, you know, 21st century, you have to give something that looks like something that the economy would fill this franchise of. Oh, no, we don't want to buy from them. Those are animals. Uh, really, are you sure? No, we don't, you know, and the best stays in our community. When, when a brother jumped in my, if, if I'm in 1920 and some white boy jumps in my Cadillac, I'm going to put on my cap like I'm the cab driver. I'm going to drive you to the destination. I'm going to drive home and say, huh, Martha, <laughs> this white guy thought I was a taxi driver. Give me a tip. What a dummy. <laughs> Doesn't know I own the car. <laughs> the idea is to give the, give you the idea that I'm not what you think I am. You, you think I am what you think I am. Actually, you're jumping in the car and thinking, hey, you're a taxi driver. Come on. Hey, step on it. Because you think I work for the taxi company. You don't think this cab is mine. Or think, you don't think the cab. Remember the idea that I'm subscribing to be a cab driver is in fact mine. And when I get home, I'm laughing at all. Like, <laughs> this guy's an idiot. And he gave me money. Yeah. Well, wow. Well, I guess we'll just keep it here because, uh, well, this is all about us, right? Mm-hmm. That's right. All right. All right. Hey, if you can make some pump, pumpkin pie, that'd be great. Love that pumpkin pie. You already know. Hey, kids, how's it going? Hey, look what I made. I made a hundred bucks. This study thought I, I uh, well, you wouldn't understand. Here, go have fun. You know? <laughs> so the idea is to give them something that's an illusion that, that we would like ourselves to personify and being ex- to, to basically be shunned away from, not to be done business with, and things of this nature. And the people that really know we're doing it, in fact, know that we're doing it. And benefit from what we're doing. Now, other, 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 other places, you know, they're going to be places that are, people that are going to come to our, our residence. They're going to come to our place of business. They're going to, they're going to want to FaceTime and do all this, this fancy stuff that basically tells us how prosperous we are. The idea is in the 21st century, if I can't walk up and go to a Rockefeller house and show how prosperous America is based on what we spend to make Rockefeller so wealthy, we shouldn't be doing that anywhere. In our community, mm-hmm. it's not about the prosperity. It's the fact that if it's if it's known among the people, this shouldn't be known to our enemies. You should not allow your enemy to know exactly what you have or what you're doing. I mean, I'm quite sure you can go to work and you know everybody's bank statement in there, except for the people uh, that prospers best. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you have no idea what they're making, do you? No idea. You don't know what their bank account looks like. You don't know. You may not even know what they who they who they're married to. But that's the whole point of our community. We know everything, but have nothing. Hmm. They have everything and say nothing. <laughs> so it's a complete opposite. We're we're living in the opposite. We're in the world of 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 sight and see and feel and touch and taste and 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 trinkets and and we're still into that phase. Like you know, if you give me something, I'll be quiet. Right. We're, we're we're still charted as as a as a as a, as a petty people, <laughs> you know. You you give me a you give me a Mercedes. You matter of fact, you got the the best examples of rappers right now is that I'll do anything for 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 a rapping contract. If you're willing to do anything, and they do something to you, and that secret is held at at ensuring that you're going to produce a particular music to destroy your community on the basis of what you signed up for, and then that liability. You know that liability of what they did to you is something you have to carry. Then if you can carry those secrets, you should be able to carry the secret of our community. Yeah, That should not be given to anybody. Nobody should know what we're doing. Right, right, right. Are you familiar with the name Robert Mercer? No, sir. He is actually the um, one of the chief funders of the, of the Trump administration. He's actually been caught up on the radar on the Democracy Now!, Amy Goodman show, and um, he's, like, swore the secrets. He really gives no interviews to anyone at all, you know, very, a man of very few words, but that, that principle of which you speak is, is present amongst those who are in power many times. You don't know what they're doing, right. you know, so I, I definitely hear exactly. what you're saying, you know, um, and that's something I think that we, we can definitely do better, you know, the art of war is something that we definitely need to understand. And understand strategy and how, you know, we operate in silence, you know, as it relates to our interests. But but we're very open and transparent with one another. I think there has to be that trust that we develop with one another in terms of really developing that. So I definitely agree and subscribe to that principle as well. I mean, I mean, I mean, if you have I mean, if you have what I got and I got what you got, then where where is there to tell somebody else? If two people have the same thing, why, why is there why, why is there a secret among us that everybody else don't need to know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
mean, if you got a million dollars under your under your pillowcase, and I got a million dollars under my desk, <laughs> why should the neighbors know what we're doing? I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? So it's it's not like you have to announce that we're the authoritarians, that you have to announce that we have authority, that you have to announce that we're the... Because what's going to happen is, in reality, by even peeping, even saying that, saying independence in any way, shape, form, or fashion, will be the public announcer of the general entity, the United States, coming in and saying, what? Black people own what? Hold up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's been going on? Wait a minute. Hold on. They live like what? And that's when you see your legislators rolling up their, up their sleeves, calling every anybody that's in political science, in a financial science, in economical science, and figure a way to destroy us. <laughs> that's when you're going to have some of the, the, the dirtiest minds sitting in Washington. You're going to see a fl- I mean, I'm talking about if you had a heat signature sitting on Washington, it would light up like a Christmas tree. Right. Right. These people are going to be at work 24 hours a day, seven days a week to destroy us. There's no question about that. Mm. So given that, no question. given so, that, so, how, so, how, how do you protect yourself? actually does have a benefit. I'm sorry, go ahead, bro. Uh, and the, I asked that question earlier. I think you misunderstood the question, but how do you protect yourself in light of that? How have you protected yourself, you know, given the information that you have and the, and the, and the, the moves you've made, you know, how have you protected yourself? No, and then how as a people no, will we no, go about protecting no ourselves? Give, oh, no one's giving me anything. I, I've used corporations for the longest. Corporations is the, is the deity of separation. It's the deity of separation. That means I can erect something and not even put my name on it. Simply because I have a seal. That's what corporations use to separate themselves from... The, think about it. Why do you think everybody at the lower rung, every, everybody from... The brokers, the subcontractors, even some of the uh, some of the premier contractors that were involved in the huge trade off of all these marked up securities. Why do you think a good portion of those people went to jail, but the people upstairs did? Because they don't sign these documents; they seal them. They seal them with the confidence of the company agreeing to the terms and conditions that if the company's liable. The people at the table have already agreed that their service, their servants, I mean, I'm sorry, their, their severance and packaging the debt is that if they can, agree, they can get their government to agree that if you're carrying a burden, you're carrying it with me, bail me out because then you look bad if you don't. Then that's what happens. So the idea is really just like you, everybody talks about the seals in religion. The seal actually is the protection. This seal is, is produced by those that have ideas that generally conceive, or let's just say, have, have prescribed to the idea that they all agree that under a seal, no one that breaks the seal, meaning to, to say something that appeals to, attra- to the attraction of, of being seen as illegitimate. If I'm under seal, my contract basically says under seal, I am to say nothing to no one and, and, and give no full disclosure unless the company's representation tells him he can say so. This is the reason why when you see in movies, they're all sitting down and the district attorney says something to him and the lawyer leans in and says, yeah, yeah, that's a legal question. Yeah, you can answer that. <laughs> because the company is responding, not the individual that did wrong, but because the company doesn't represent the people then the people that were engineered to sell these things ultimately go to jail because, they, first of all, a majority of them didn't have licenses to sell securities, open, uh, well, these, these packaged securities, to the public. Mm-hmm. Even though the company ultimately did not, all the banks denied that they were selling these, these pooled investments, they were up, they were literally, um, uh, they were literally the, the, the arm of what the government ultimately was trying to deny publicly as well. Oh, no, we had no idea these securities were being swapped and negotiated and renegotiated, repackaged, revamped, and sold again. We had no idea. But here's the thing. If FDIC insures these things, these securities are open market. That means that even though you may have a PPM or a security agreement, you still have to have it filed with the Security and Exchange Commission. So you think this wasn't public? Everybody knew what they were doing except for the public. Because <laughs> you weren't researching who was filing the securities. You were researching uh, uh, the bank's uh, the securitization process. You're like, oh, this is not all that signature. This is a seal here and this. Yeah, but that's the whole point. They sell your original under seal. They have a contract that convolutes where the law begins. And let me, let me, let me make it, let me, let me stop with the, <laughs> the words are getting big. I'm sorry. 
So here the <laughs> banks are saying that their seal separates them from the liability. The, the, the bank itself is the liability party. And since the bank is, is deep in the pockets of the Federal Reserve, who lends all this money, and the Federal Reserve would, would have to levy itself all the money it sold illegally for these illegal securities, they then had to bail themselves out. So they had to give the money, they have to give all the tax money that ultimately ruined the entire process. The same money that you would have saved by producing a job, they put it into their pocket. And by doing that, they said, okay, well, here's a problem. We took too much of it. If you give us a bailout, then just pass laws to regain the confidence of the people by raising the revenue status on the basis of need more money because of these situations, uh, sets of circumstances. No mm-hmm. one can't create jobs. Well, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to sell every relationship. We have to throw some people in the street. Mm. And that's what happened from 2008 all the way till now, which is they dumped the market. Uh, and decided to mend their relationship with the Fed, asked for more, the, the bank asked for more regulations. We need to be controlled. Please stop us from stealing the money <laughs> from the Treasury. That's crazy. <laughs> so bail us out and we'll act right. And, and that's basically what happened. So that's how you protect yourself. Okay. Your seal and your corporation is your artificial power. That's what it is artificial power. If you don't practice the art of artificial power, you are basically asking to get into trouble if you decide you're going to do it like an open forum. We're all going to agree on this and, and, and sign it and uh, yeah, they're going to have to do this. No, they're going to just take your tax money and put it into another bill and then disenfranchise you further. They're just going to come up with a new idea. Mm. That's it. Okay. okay. They write bills every single day. So <laughs> unless you're under a seal and you've incorporated these laws, they are going to, they're going to use them with absolute certainty to disenfranchise you. No Good. questions asked. That's powerful. That's powerful. Yes, sir. So we got about five minutes left till the show is up. Uh, we did have a caller call in. Caller, are you there? All right, I guess not. Um, man, Professor, F- hello. Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, I thought I heard someone else about to say something. Um. Any closing thoughts that you want to share with our listeners, Professor Phil? Well, everyone can find me at Politics and Money, www.politicsandmoneyinc.com. That's www.politicsandmoneyinc.com. Uh, email is P-R-O-F, short for Professor Phil, P-H-I-L, which is P-R-O-F, P-H-I-L, at as the exclusive website is politicsandmoneyinc.com. Um, I can be reached by phone at 424-245-9408. Um, that text or, or call. And um, uh, pretty much I'm trying to take applications to expand uh, so that I'm just not expounding information. It's actually being used by the people. And uh, that's my main dialogue is, is to ensure that the people can use it. Uh, but disenfranchising those for power uh, is just something that, that you, you have to erode from the, you have to erect that from the back of your mind is that this is going to be something of yours. This is a creation of a collective power. And it's, it's, it's way, it's way above you is way above my pay grade is the fact that all of us have to be doing the same thing. And at, at the end of the day, Oh, also find me at Facebook with brother Ben uh, at uh, facebook.com forward slash P H I L L I P G I L O N. Also, I'm holding, a, I, I post that on your page. I almost forgot about that. Uh, April 1st, I'll be holding a, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. April 1st in uh, Baltimore, I'll be holding a, um, uh, a, a huge demonstration here, uh, talking about the same uh, economical achievements that I've, 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 I've attempted to do, uh, that I'm trying to get involved in, contract and facilitate a, um, a means of production, being able to uh, cater to this, uh, cater to this, to several entities at the same time, and the city of Baltimore, including the inhabitants and anyone that that may, may be available. Uh, I definitely get down there. Um, uh, oh boy, let me see here. Uh, look up the flyer here. It's uh, you'll notice it'll say economical empowering Baltimore, so-called black populist, republic tax, republic taxes, sovereignty, control, and power. 
uh, you'll notice that it'll have a big flyer saying Black Power and, and uh, have a few uh, um, other forms of lingo. Brother's holding in his hand, uh, sarcastically, it seems. Uh, again, set, uh, Saturday, April 1st, it would be at the Arch Social Club from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, the address is 2946 Pennsylvania Avenue. And uh, uh, brother Ben, I hope you you send um, uh, I hope you send your people down there because you know the the greater this becomes, where all of us are on a, an agreeing path of collectiveness, uh, each group can have their own belief systems uh, and benefit from them as well, uh, as long as it's 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 a tolerated uh, means of an end to, to to end the cycle of our of our uh, our deep depression. Our depression among each other to, to 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 know that we're depriving each other of the life and liberty that we pursue among each other, but we we act in this competitive sense of ideas and beliefs that separate us. We we need to come together at the table regardless of belief system, God, or or, or orientation. I don't really care about anyone's particular God or belief system. All I care about is is that if all of us is doing something reciprocating a benefit. A benefit to the collective, then then I'm 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 wealthy simply because I know that my people are being taken care of and I'm being taken care of as well. So that's that's the bottom line. That's what I'm after. And uh, like I said, I'm, I'm I'm hoping brothers and sisters to show up there April first. Um, I posted on your uh, your page as well, uh, yes, brother sir. Ben. And um, yeah, that's my uh, that's my two cents of uh, two cents of financial liberty. I'm hoping that uh. It turns out pretty well because this is something where I'm not just talking about politics and money. I'm not just talking about Zeb Tepe. It's an action. It's something that needs to be done and it has to be improved on because the people have to the people have to come to the table. They have to come to the table. This isn't this isn't a me thing. This is an us thing. Right on, right on. Powerful, powerful. Uh, can you give me that number, yes, the four two four number, one more time? So I, I'm gonna put it all in the text box of this particular podcast so people can actually. Have it accessible to them. Okay. Well, I have actually two numbers. Hold on one second. I have a four two four two four five nine four zero eight. My primary number. You can text or call me there. Uh, and my other number is nine one nine four hundred two nine four nine. Two nine four nine. You can text or call me on. Yes, you can call me on either number. That's nine one again. That's nine one nine. Four hundred two nine four nine. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So you have been listening to Politics and Money with Professor Phil Gillen here on Hebrew Vision Live. We want to thank you, brother, for 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 sharing your your time and your mind with us. And prayerfully, those who have listened or are and are going to listen will be definitely informed and and, and encouraged and inspired to. To do something, you know, and that's what we really want to do when we get the voice of the people out. And um, I'll definitely be in touch with you in the near future, and we'll continue to move forward and do what we need to do to get our people free, man. So thank you once again, Professor Phil, for joining us on Hebrew Vision Live, man. I'm, 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 I'm glad you changed your mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you did that. Yes, sir. It never uh, really deviated I from it. I just, it, I just had some things I was working on in some other way. I haven't changed my mind from what I know was uh, before. I just had to come back around to it. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't like I, I had completely, you know, just ban abandoned the thought. It was just other things had come up, man. You know, some projects I'm working on. So that's what it is. But I definitely see the need for this, um, especially with our people, man. So we definitely need to get this on on, on the ground. In as many places as we can. And this is the international paradigm, too, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes, sir. It isn't just a domestic thing. Matter of fact, uh, once we really get it off the table, we'd be doing trade with Africa and other uh, foreign nations and, and representation of an Africa-like diaspora domestically here to localize um, the ingenuity, the creation, and the power uh, of, uh, of a divine just and brotherly type and sisterly, uh, sisterly integrated system so that we don't have to be dependent on anything. If we don't have turnips, uh, we, we can call our brothers to, to the east, west, south, wherever they happen to be. And, uh, and our exchanges will primarily be the same as if though you were in the regular marketplace. You'll get the, the same 
first class service that I would equate myself to if I want to be uh, equal to my brother. I'm going to give you exactly what I would like. Uh, in essence of what you will reciprocate to me. If you're giving me something good, I'm going to give you something in return. There's no question about it. So I'm, I'm trying to end this uh, this dependency, our, our, our hunger for the need of authoritarianism and, and start thinking and doing for ourselves. We don't need nobody. We need each other. I agree wholeheartedly. Or, and you already know I'm in the building, baby. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's up, man. Yeah, I mean, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Well, that's what's up, man. We're going to go ahead and close our show out for this evening. I want to uh, thank all of our listeners for tuning in to Hebrew Vision Live. I want to thank Professor Phil again. And this is our theme song. We're going to let our people go. And we're going to move on. Tune in on Thursday. We're going to have a brother Keith Horton live here from New Ever, Detroit. He's going to be talking about being ready for the revolution and what's going on in Detroit as well. Professor Phil, thanks again. We're going to sign off on Hebrew Vision. Peace and blessings.